Today on the 1012 Podcast, we wrap up Rankings Week by doing our Big 12 preseason rankings. Joining me are Andy Mitz of Rock Chalk Podcast and Shahan J. Araja of CBS Sports. We are ranking all 16 teams. This one went two hours. We had a lot to say about everyone. We definitely had disputes. We all had our own thoughts and opinions. An absolutely fantastic way to end Rankings Week. If you haven't yet, go check out Every episode we've done this week, five episodes, tons of content to get you ready for the season. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. We are live for the final night of Rankings Week here on the 10-12 podcast. Thank you to everybody who's watching tonight, who's watched this week. Very excited about our final show. We we saved the obvious one for last. We're just going to do our preseason ranking. I mean, it seemed like the easiest thing to do on Thursday night to wrap all of this fantastic week up that started on Sunday, ends tonight. And joining me tonight, I'm Philip. Hi, I'm the host of the 10-12 podcast. Every podcast is someone's first. I said it right this time. Finally. Uh, joining me tonight to wrap up this absolutely fantastic week. I've had a ton of fun, a lot of great guests, been incredible. I'm very excited for tonight. My usual co-host during football season, a man who needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyways, because he is the host of the Rock Shock podcast. He's with me all the time. Uh, Kansas fans love him. Kansas State fans love to hate him. He is Andy Mitz. How's it going? Good to be back. It's Looking been too forward long. to when we do this all the time again. It's so close. We're so we're so close to the start of the season, and uh, I don't, I'm I'm ready to talk about actual football again. Like I've reached the point. I, I hold on before I get to that tangent. Also joining us, very excited, always happy when he's here. It's and I I know people will come just because he's here. Shahanji Araja, the most stylish and fashionable man at any and every media day. Shahan, welcome back, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been a it's been a little while. I've uh, turned down maybe one or two podcast requests in the past couple of weeks because I do have a six month old at home. But uh, thankfully, she is fast asleep now, and hopefully, that doesn't change in the next uh, thirty minutes to an hour. Have Have we done sleep training yet? Yeah, so she's real good, thankfully. She she overall is a really good, really calm baby. So she usually goes to bed at like 7, 7.30. Last night was like the first time that we tried not doing a scheduled nighttime feeding, and she slept through the night. So we're hoping that that continues now, but it also means I should probably not yell too loud uh, whenever we get into our hotter takes. Okay, so we'll we'll keep and and there will be plenty of them. And there also, will be plenty. Also, welcome to your semi weekly um, big or ten twelve network parenting corner. Yes, uh, <laughs> we, it it happens a lot here. Okay, uh, Shahan, I I have to ask you something. I got a little bit of a bone. Uh, as soon as Big Twelve Media Day started, I'm sitting here like scrolling around, like, all right, what Shahan's fit? What's he looking? What's he wearing? And your two days in, in, in Vegas were fine. And then you show up to SEC media days and you saved all the good stuff for four days in Dallas. Sean, I'm a little bit, I'm a little disappointed that you were like, I'm going to pack everything good for, for SEC. And I'm just going to wear two nice suits for, uh, for big 12. Shahan. Well, on, well, that's the opportune word. You said pack. I had to pack for Vegas, whereas I did not have to pack for SEC because it was right in my backyard in Dallas, Texas. This is my one little shot at the Big 12 this year. If you want my best, you got to you gotta service me first. Uh, but no, I, really, the other part of it, too, was that we did 10 days at my in-law's house in San Jose before we went to Vegas. And so the idea of packing like three suits to go with, uh, you know, 10 days worth of stuff to go to California on top of, by the way, this was the first time that we had ever traveled with our, with our six month old. Ooh, it was just, yeah. th- th- there was okay. no way okay. I we right. can give you a break. I could <laughs> into my bag. And I pretty much called it a day there. <laughs> look, look, if I get to use, I have three small kids as an excuse, like uh, Small children are always a valid excuse or reason for any decision made. So 
<laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it be. Uh, the old, the off season is almost done. And I'm, I feel like, uh, I'm curious you guys thoughts before we dive into our rankings. I, I enjoy, I'm not on the bandwagon of like NIL and, and paying players and realignment and all these other things ruin college football. I'm not like, okay, if, if you don't want to watch anymore, that's fine. I think you're probably full of just trying to sound cool on the internet. Um, and you're going to watch, I'm going to watch tons of college football or as much as I can with three small kids. What I don't like as much anymore is the off season, the off season that used to be fun to follow recruiting and get excited about teams and every once in a while, you know, once a year we get some sort of like coach scandal that we're all like, oh, Urban Meyer, uh, whatever Ohio State head coach it is. Bob Soups is retiring in the middle of March. Like now it's now the off season just feels like longer and it feels less fun. like recruiting is fun. But then in the back of your mind, I hate being pessimistic. I'm like, yeah, but they might not be here then in any season or two. I just I don't know. I don't know. How do you guys feel about the off season now? Because I, I feel like. I look forward to the season more because I enjoy the off season a lot less than I used to. Yeah. I mean, this feels a lot more like NFL off season now where, right. Where it's all, it all feels transactional. It all feels like, Hey, something's going to happen money wise for, uh, you know, until we can figure out, you know, what these teams look like and someone's going to move and something like you just expect something to happen. You can't ever feel like you're locked in with, you know, what's going to come next because Hey, now the transfer portal can happen any time in the you know, entire summer teams that are still looking for you know holes to fill right now can pretty much fill them all the way up until classes start. So yeah, it, it feels much more like a professional league off season in that you just don't really know what's going on and everything kind of seems transactional at this point. Well, and I'll tell you what, as somebody who obviously is a national writer, the thing that I hate is going on shows and podcasts in March, April, May, June. And all the questions are big picture in terms of like the governance of the sport, the lawsuits, just all this sort of stuff. There's very little even attempt to talk much football because there's an understanding that we truly don't know anything. And I even look at, you know, one of one of the Big 12 member schools, I look at a program like Colorado, it's like we can't even really talk about them because it's changed so much right we, we literally know nothing in, in some ways about some of these programs because of how many changes have been made so i i do agree that um that i do think that it's it's impacted the juice of the off season in some ways i actually remember having this conversation too it felt like spring football was as dead as it had ever been you know it, it felt like there was no storylines coming out of it, no interesting notes coming out of it. Of course, there's an understanding that post spring, the transfer portal opens once again, and that could come in and change everything in an instant. And so I, I do think that, look, this is sort of the uh, the wild west of it all, right? The, the first couple of years of major NIL and transfer portal, you know, in the next year or two, we're going to get revenue sharing. That's going to be an even bigger sort of uh, wrinkle to things as well. I do think that when we look five or 10 years from now, they'll have settled some of the stuff down. But the reality is, look at any sport in the world. You can't just be in a situation where any player can become a free agent at essentially any time. That's just not how it works. And especially in a sport. And actually, you know, we talk football. For me, it's been most killer in basketball. Like I was at Baylor from 12 to 16. You know, I was there with Tori and Prince. I was there with Rico Gathers. You know, some of these players who were there for four years and you got to enjoy. I do think that um, college sports has always been developmental at its core. And it's a little weird now for sure that you don't get really any opportunity to build multi-year relationships with players. Yeah, it it just, it needs to settle. I mean, I... I I know you made the NFL comp, Andy, but like even the NFL is more settled than this. Like, there, like, yes, you're making offseason moves. We have the, we, you know, we, 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 NBA, all these things. And, but like that stuff's exciting and interesting because you have an idea going to like, well, maybe there's a trade, but it's not yeah. like anyone there are and rules. everyone. Fits there are rules yeah. structure to all of for this. it. Right. That's, right. that's the issue. There are rules yeah, this is, and there are no this, rules yeah. right now. This is unstructured chaos, whereas most free agency, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's chaotic, but it's structured at least. Yeah, like you understand how it's supposed to work, and you have an idea of like it, the only, the shocker is when it is when a trade happens, right? It's not oh, our right. entire wide receiver. The shock is the they details, to leave not because the fact that things are happening. <laughs> a head coach left, or the receiving coach left in April, or some other. It's just like it's just 
it's too unwieldy and there has to be some structure applied. And I, I understand I'm good with the fun and uniqueness of college football, but like if there is something from the professional model that I would be happy to see, it is a sense of structure where there is some familiarity, some understanding, some, you know, a little bit more in the off season than we do right now. And because you don't know, as you mentioned, Shahan, then the conversations are just all about realignment and lawsuits and, we're waiting for the grant of rights for the ACC to come up so that we can all pretend like we're going to read it, know all about it. And four people are going to read it and they're going to write about it. And I'm just like, I, I just, can we just have, can we just have football? Can we just have games? Like, <laughs> I just, uh, thank goodness for college softball for me. Cause it at least distracts me from all that for a few months. Okay. Uh, we are here to actually talk about some football as best as we can with as much knowledge or lack thereof as we actually have about the big 12 going into the season. So we're going to rank all 16 teams, uh, Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to do the same way we've done each of these nights. I'm going to have one of you, and I think we're going to let Shahan do this since he's our, our big guest of the night. Sorry, Andy. Uh, we're going to let Shahan do his in order 16 to 1. And then as Shahan puts his, I, Andy can say where he has that team ranked. I'll say where I have my team ranked. Then we'll talk about it so that we're not doing, you know, we just talk one team at a time <laughs> as opposed to we talk about this one here and this one three spots later and yada, yada, yada. This is, this is how we've done it all week, and it's worked pretty well so uh and and this time we know we're gonna have 16 teams it's not like we're gonna rank 10 players but we're actually gonna talk about 18 so uh shahan i'm gonna let you start things off here um with number 16 we'll go 16 to 1 who do you have finishing dead last as the worst team in the big 12 conference this season (laughs) i have those houston cougars and i have a lot of faith in willie fritz i think he is a tremendous coach and in two or three years, like this is going to be a team that's contending for the big 12, but it's just the, the state of the roster right now is kind of insane. I I remember heading into last year, I kind of said, are you allowed to build a whole team out of wide receivers and nothing else and win (laughs) games? And the answer was no, you're not. You lose a lot of games that way and, uh, and lose your head coaching job at the university of Houston. But I think that, it's just going to be a roster and transition in so many ways. Now, look, when you talk about being last place in this conference at this time, like Houston would not be last place in most of the conferences of the last five years or so. Like they just wouldn't. But I think that, uh, you know, you have a player like Donovan Smith who might be one of the better quarterbacks in the big 12 if some things go the right way, but it's the trench play. It's the losses. It's even the talent they lost at wide receiver to the transfer portal. It's just so many things that they have to deal with all while transitioning to a brand new system as well. That's going to go from being, you know, sort of a, a combination spread air raid type thing under Dana Holgerson to now being more of a spread option type system, which I think could be a transition. And I did go look back as well at Willie Fritz and, and his history and, this, this isn't a coaching staff that necessarily has quick turnarounds. They, they build long-term. And so I think that that's more what it's going to be. Andy, where do you have Houston? Yeah, I mean, I have Houston at 15. I do think that they'll be slightly better than one particular team. But, I mean, yeah, they are going to struggle this year. Um, you know, I, I do think that they kind of get a little bit of a downgrade, kind of like what you're talking about, because it is a new coach, new system. We've seen that before. I do think the fact that they're not, you know, changing time zones and not changing uh, conferences is going to help them here where you have a few other teams that are probably going to have to get used to playing in the central time zone, playing in, you know, the Eastern time zone for, for West Virginia and UCF like multiple times in a year. So I do think that they have a couple things going for them, but not enough to get them out of the basement um, of the conference. I do think that 15 is where I have them, but to be honest, my, you know, 13 through 15, I could probably interchange and be happy with it. So I have them at 15 as well. And it, it kind of came down to, and look, the schedule game is so hard to play (laughs) because everything is different. And we really like, it's all based off what we think teams will be. And as we have seen, that means nothing once the games actually kick off, but the, the, I put them 15 over who I have at 16 just because of the way the schedule stacks up. 
Um, I, I think that the schedule of my number 16, I, I, let's just do this way. Shahan, who's your 15? Yeah, you yeah. Actually, I, I want to talk about this too, right? So Arizona State is my 15. I assume that that's yes. your 16. The yes. reason that Amen. I Amen. went with that is because here's Houston's home schedule uh, in conference. Iowa State, that's like a guaranteed loss. Utah, guaranteed loss. Kansas State, guaranteed loss. The one that maybe they have a chance in is that Baylor game. That, uh, and I still think that Baylor's going to be better than them. The difference is I have Arizona State beating BYU. That's that's literally the difference between these two games is that I think that Arizona State has one home game that I think that they that I think they can win. I think that Houston most likely has zero. And actually, when I did my game-by-game projections, right, because they play winnable games, but it's at Cincinnati, it's at Arizona, it's at BYU, it's at TCU. They, they play all of their winnable games on the road. I don't think that Houston has the juice to be able to go on the road and win uh, a road game against a, a sort of a 50-50 opponent, whereas I think that uh, for Arizona State, BYU is one that I think that they could potentially get. Yeah, the, the one thing that I will say is that I see Houston as a team that can get better over the course of the season as they get more familiar with Willie Fritz's system, and they might steal one at the end of the year, um, especially against one of those other teams that's not in contention for anything, Um, whereas I'm not sure that Arizona State can do the same. And and I think really what it comes down to at that point is, and and I kind of did a mix here of like, what do I think the final standings are going to look like and how would I actually rank those teams, you know, power ranking wise. Um, I think that those last four are kind of all in the same boat together in terms of where they're going to finish around in, in actual like conference standings and stuff. Sure. And so I, I just, I, I feel like Houston's probably got a little bit more juice than Arizona state does at this point, but it's, I mean, it's, it's small amounts that we're talking about. There's, there's not a huge difference. I wouldn't be shocked if, if, you know, either of those teams finished 13th instead of, you know, 15th or 16th. I think that's fair. I mean, I, I you, like you look at Arizona and that state and Houston, and I know you said four. Like to me, those are the two worst teams in the conference. Like that is my that is the. I agree. So I think I think they're is, their own tier. And so yes, and so it's kind of like you know, one gets one win that one doesn't. They end up the same record, and so they tie because one beat the eighth best team and one didn't. And so like, I just don't think there's a lot that separates the two of them. Um, I I get the point on the home schedule. I think Arizona State's schedule is a little bit harder just based off who they have to play. If you take the home road, kind of out of it because the Big 12 is so weird. But I mean, we're we're banana, potato, potato in this situation. <laughs> we're it's literally fair, splitting like, hairs here. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, uh, I believe the saying is rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Like we're just, it's just an exercise in futility, do, caring about who finishes 15 versus 16 so uh we will move on from those two i'm really sorry to arizona state and houston fans it's gonna be a rough season for both (laughs) of you um i know that i know that uh, our good friend ralph amsden who covers arizona state's a little bit higher on them than than we all are maybe they'll be this year's west virginia they did have a lot of injury issues last year maybe they stay healthy like i I did like some of the stuff that i heard from them right defensively i think they're gonna be notably better and they have some playmakers that they brought in i i love the relique brown addition as a running back from usc former five star uh jake smith you know was formerly the gatorade player of the year although he hasn't played in a little while so like i, I feel like they have some dudes it really is just a trenches conversation like that if their trenches are not ready which i don't expect them to be then it's just going to be hard for them to to compete for much of anything yeah uh okay so 14. Gosh, there's 16 teams. I, I, I know. We got to. I'm, I'm just not. I don't know how. I'm, <laughs> we got to pick up the pace. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I'll, I'll, tell no, it's, it's I'll, I'll tell you what. I know. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, I used to, you know, whenever uh, whenever CBS Sports would kind of run through and do a conference-by-conference conference thing, of course, I'd usually get the Big 12. And my job used to be so much easier, man. I have to do, like, twice as much work for no extra pay. It's crazy. I can't believe that. But um, my number 14 team is BYU. And this one kind of sucks because I think that BYU is going to be notably better, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And I just don't think it matters because of that schedule, right? Like I mentioned, they go on the road to Arizona state. That's a game that I really feel like they need to try and win. They get Houston at home. Those are pretty good. 
the rest of the schedule, man, it is not good. It's versus Kansas State at Baylor. That's kind of a 50-50 game. Arizona at home, Oklahoma State at home, at UCF, at Utah versus Kansas. Like that is that is either 0 and 6 or 1 and 5. Like I, I just don't see how they get more than that. And they're really relying so much on internal improvement. And I don't know that I love the guys who they're hoping improve, you know, just frankly. So uh, for me, they're 14. Again, like this is not a team over the past five years in the Big 12 that would finish third to last in the conference, but that's just kind of where they're at right now. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Yeah, I mean, BYU, I think their their big thing last year was that the running game was atrocious. Yeah. And I don't know that they really did much to actually improve it, yes. both line and running back yeah. position themselves. So to expect those guys to make that much of a difference and give them an opportunity, especially when they play, I mean, they play the, you know, the teams picked one through five in, in the Big 12 media poll. And Eat that. <laughs> Yeah, only one of them is on the road. So, like, most of their home schedule, like you're talking about, is teams that you fully expect to come in and potentially trounce them. Um, Oh, and that one on the road, it's at Utah. So, like, (laughs) you don't even get the benefit of the the big rivalry game at home this year uh, to really kind of juice them up. Like, their their two games that I think would be winnable are the final two, that at Arizona State and versus Houston, and that very well may decide who actually is – the bottom of the conference if, if they get to the point where they're just you know beat down and and trying to just finish out the year i could see this being an issue uh where you know they only win one game in conference because they're just so beat up throughout the course of the season and, and one last thing too i i just think for them offensively because again i expect their defense to take a little bit of a step who is the playmaker that that you can just kind of change this offense, right? Chase Roberts is a good player, but he's not somebody who you want to be your number one option on your entire team, right? Like LJ Martin, kind of interesting young running back, not a guy who you want to have to go out and make plays for you. And I, I just don't see who that guy is. And I mean, frankly, even for those bottom two teams, I feel like I see more sort of upside at playmaker than I see at BYU. And in a league that is so dynamic, I mean, you just have to have somebody. Uh, that last two weeks were Bay, BYU. By the way, Andy, where do you have BYU? 14? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. So, yes, I do too. Um, that last two weeks where they have Arizona State and Houston. I mean, Andy, your point is true. Like that might decide who finishes in last place in conference play. The other thing for BYU schedule wise is they didn't really do themselves any favors this year. Like you open with Southern Illinois, who is a solid enough FCS team. I'm not picking yep. them to beat BYU, but it's a solid FCS team. What the Big 12 this year? What are y'all doing with North Dakota State, South Dakota State, Southern Illinois? What? Ugh, just just pay the play the prairie, pay the Prairie Views of A and M's to come and and do whatever. Hey, Prairie View's pretty good now. That that's not the team you want either. Get Texas Southern. There you look, go. look, look, look. They're they're angling for that uh, at large bid into the college football playoff. They go to SMU and they go to Wyoming in yep. non-conference. Like their first, their first five weeks could be very bad. And look, we've seen teams have a rough start, go into a bye week. You got two bye weeks this year. I don't, sorry, out of weeks and, and kind of figure some things out, but there could be a really rough start. The kind of start where by the time you get to the end of the season, do they have anything left in the tank to even care? And and I just like, it could get ugly. It could get ugly for BYU. And we may be talking about like, maybe we should group them not from a talent standpoint, but just from a, like the way the schedule stacks up, we might need to group them with 15 and 16 at Houston and Arizona state, just the way things stack up. Like it could get ugly. I I don't think BYU is going to be as bad as their record is, as you kind of said, Sean, but right. Like it's hard in a 16 team conference with, Obviously, there's not a an Ohio State or a Georgia at the top of the conference, but there's enough good teams at the conference that you hate is such a slog, and it always is. But I mean, now it is such a slog 
because of how many good teams you have at the top of the conference who are all contending that if you're at the bottom, I'm not saying you're not going to pull off an upset because it's the big 12 and stuff happens all the time. But man, oh man, if you're going to have to pull off like five or six or seven or eight upsets, that's not a spot you really want to be in as a team who is has an inferior talent level to everybody else. Well, right. and, and, and it's, just, well, I was go going to say, it's, it's not like most of the ones we're talking about being upsets, like our coin flip games or, you know, 60, 40, like the vast majority of those games would be monumental upsets coming into the right. year. Right. And, and like, I expect them to get one of like of the home ones. I, I do expect them to get one, but like mm-hmm. they could get one. And there is a pathway to even if they got one, still starting two and eight, right? Like it, it, there is a pathway. I'm not picking it. I think that they'll win probably uh, probably five games is about where I have them. But it, like it's on the table, you know, that they could start one and nine just with the schedule that they've got, uh, you know. But but I think that the transitional team for me at number thirteen a little bit is Cincinnati. I do think that uh, unlike BYU, I see some of the the interesting pieces offensively. Corey Kiner, a thousand yard rusher last year. All anybody can talk about right now is Brendan Sorsby at Cincinnati. Like people are excited about him coming in as a transfer quarterback from Indiana. Um, I didn't realize how young he was. I don't know why. I, I, I think that he just has one of those Big Ten names that I'm like, I've heard that name for a decade. He must be a fifth year senior or something. But no, he's he's a sophomore. He has a lot of eligibility left. Um, you know, defensively, of course, uh, Dante Corleone missed a little bit of time this offseason because of some uh, some health issues. Thankfully, it seems like he's back with the team now, so hopefully that won't be an issue. But this was a defense that was terrible against the run last year. They're going to have to be better in that aspect. But I think the, the offense gives them a little bit of a higher floor than they had last year. It's just, again, I mean, this is going to be the case. Like, if you are a bottom half team in the Big 12 – Every week is hard, essentially, because most of the Big 12 is just above average teams in college football. So I I do think that they're going to be noticeably improved. So I have them at number 13. Yeah, I also have them at 13. And I mean, I look at what they have there. Like, I think the one thing that they have kind of, well, kind of working against them this year is very similar to last year in that they never really had a stretch on their schedule where they could build any momentum. Yeah, You know, they had, they had a, good team and then a team that they should beat you know a good team a team they should beat um it's very similar this year like you know they start out with Towson and then they play Pittsburgh then they go to Miami Ohio which that's not a guarantee for them (laughs) um you know and then and then they play Houston they go to Texas Tech play you or at UCF and then they have ASU um you know they're they're like theoretically they could beat Colorado at Colorado but again that's not a gimme game for them at all by any stretch of the imagination. And so, and then they have a brutal stretch at the end of the year where, you know, it's West Virginia, Iowa state, Kansas state, TCU. Like we could be looking back at this team and the way that they finish kind of colors the way we think about this team, even if they actually have a fairly solid season. I have them here too. And I, if we're going to call BYU Houston Arizona state, a tier, the bottom tier, this next group of four teams with Cincinnati at the bottom feels like the third tier. And I, I, again, and I, we could run through, I just like Cincinnati to me, I know you say they don't have easy stretches. Like I get it. But if you're saying Cincinnati has taken a step forward, Towson Pitt, who's not going to be good at Miami of Ohio and Houston should give you a good runway. I mean, last year they had a yeah, nice. They should be four and zero, three and zero start, and then they if, got the Big Twelve play. Yeah, if things are going correctly at Cincinnati, which they might not be, uh, like they should be four and zero heading into into Texas Tech. Yeah, and then uh, look, week off at UCF, Arizona State at Colorado. Like that might be your chance to get bowl eligible because West Virginia. I mean, I don't not like West Virginia to be good. Maybe that's a spot for Cincinnati to pull off an upset. I, I I assume every team, unless you're just the worst, can pull off an upset on their schedule, right? And so, like, I think Cincinnati can get to six wins this year. I still don't think Cincinnati's great, and I still don't think Satterfield's going to work long term. But, like, I do think they should be better. And I think it's, it's a again, we're talking about when you get 16 teams, we're going to have weird tiebreakers to, for, to me to decide 10 through 13. And it, it it could just be, well, this team beat that one and that one. Like, it wouldn't shock me if you had four teams right here grouped together with the exact same record and it came down to who beat who as to how it stacks up. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. So I had them, like I mentioned, as sort of a transitional team. I do think that they're above the bottom three. I do think, though, that they're below this next year. Um, okay. When I look at my next group of, let's call it four, I think that this is a group where any of them have an outside chance, but a chance to finish like top five in the conference to maybe make it to eight or nine wins. I, I'm not picking it for any of them right this second, but I think that they have more upside to me than what Cincinnati has. And I'm starting with Baylor. Baylor is one of the tougher teams for me to truly try and evaluate. They also, by the way, they play Utah in the non-conference again. That's not going to be good for anybody, but I think what's fascinating about this Baylor team and, uh, you know, I've had so many conversations with people, obviously, you know, people know I'm a Baylor guy, like with people over the past couple of days and weeks is that this team went three and nine last year, of course, but like they're, they're doing so many things, right. First of all, like they have had as good of a lame duck coach off season as I've probably ever seen (laughs) in college football. (laughs) They brought in a coach in Jake Spavadol who did not need to leave his job at Cal. They brought in a running backs coach in Keenan Hall who did not need to leave his job at SMU as they entered the ACC. They recruited a great transfer class, including MAC Player of the Year, Daquan Finn. And I, I think the case for them is that their floor should just be a lot higher running this offensive system, right? They're moving back to a true spread uh, after trying to play like a complicated wide zone that that when they didn't have the personnel completely fell apart. Um, And and then the question, I mean, I think that the bigger question is like defensively, do they just have enough guys to plug in uh, on the interior? Because I think that they were pretty good on the exterior. It was the interior. They just got run over. And so I think, again, this is one of those teams where like maybe nothing's fixed and they go three and nine again. But I think that this is a team also that like you look at some of the playmakers that they've got, like a Richard Reese at running back, a Keytron Allen at a at, at wide receiver, like. Uh, like or Keetron Jackson, excuse me. Like these, these are really good players who could be all Big Twelve caliber if some things break right for them. So I, I have them at twelve. Uh, I, again, I, I don't think that they have the juice to like get into the conference race. But like, this is the start of my tier where I'm like, if they won eight or nine games, I don't think it would be a shock to me. Yeah, I mean, Baylor was a team from last year that kind of struck me as a. You look at them on paper and they looked awful, but then you look yeah. at like the way things happened, the way like it seemed like that was a very they were extremely unlucky. They had a lot of things go against them that you know you normally wouldn't expect. Um, and so I do think that they were better than they ended up showing last year. I, so I think this is a very similar situation to like what people were talking about with Kansas last year, right? Where the team could get better. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, the the team could you know not even necessarily get better, be the same and actually have a better record and look yeah. better because of the difference in the schedule and, and because of the difference in the way things break, or they just don't have the bad breaks that they did. Um, and, and so like, I, I do think that this is an, an instance where this Baylor team, I, I agree with you. I think that they're like, I have them right here at 12 kind of for the same reason. Like I could see them being a team that could take a jump up, but of this next group of, you know, four or five, they're probably the least likely just because of what they have. And, you know, yes, you you were talking about, like, the main hole they have is that interior on the defense. Unfortunately, as we found in the Big 12, that's probably one of the most important places to actually have good depth and have, you know, good talent there because of how good all the running backs are and how good this, you know, how, how many teams like to pound up the middle and force you to stop them there before they go outside. So I have Baylor one spot higher at 11 than you guys do. Um, and we'll, I'll explain why it's, it's one particular position group on the team. I have 12. And again, I, I do think, I, I do think Dave Aranda has taken longer to figure some things out about being a head coach than we thought after he goes and wins the big 12 in year two. Right. And I think there was a little bit of magic sauce and magic juice and players that were just fantastic and things. And, and so I think it's taken him a little while to figure out what kind of head coach he wants to be at a place that is still a little bit weird for Dave Aranda to be the head coach. Like if you say head coach in the state, head football coach, in the state of Texas, Dave Aranda is not going to be one of the names you would list off early on in this process. He's a little bit of an odd fit, 
But I do think he is figuring this out. I mean, we're watching it in real time. And they ask him, like, why are you suddenly getting good players? Because we're paying them. Like, that was a big part of the conversation. Of, like, they weren't up on handling an IL properly. And then, and we just, like, it, it, it's taking him a little while. It is very much a, like, this is the year he's got to have it figured out. I do think the influx of talent is good. I do think you brought in a quarterback who is going to who is more multifaceted than the guy you had last year, which is going to help you out a lot. And yes. so, like, I think the pieces that they have brought in, Daquan Finn, especially, I, I, I think Daquan Finn alone is worth like two wins for them. Like, you put Daquan Finn on last year's team, that's probably at worst a five win team, right? Like, I just, I, 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 I understand offensive fit, yada, yada. I just mean from yeah, a, yeah, what all he can do adds an element to the game that they really could have benefited from a lot more last year. Well, and and I'll jump in and say, you know, I think that that I'm I'm a big Blake Shapen fan. Like I think that Blake Shapen is a really good player, but also he was a pocket passer and Baylor couldn't create a pocket. And yeah. I think what Daquan Finn gives you at Baylor is an eraser, somebody who can make things happen when things aren't going to be perfect. And, you know, I think that that's a big part of why they committed so much to getting him and a player like him, somebody who's a true dual threat, because they don't know necessarily if they're going to have a great offensive line this year. And so if they don't, how can we account for that? You know, can we account with one more in the running game using that quarterback position? And uh, again, the, the old system is just so built off of, uh, precision and winning up front and, and all this sort of stuff like the the credit I have to give is you know you, you look at Jake Spavadol and and uh, you know he was a head coach at Texas State didn't really go the way that you want but his time at Cal he was so good at just figuring things out he had to use multiple different quarterbacks because of injuries but he found great spots for running back Jaden Knott to, to make things happen Jaden Knott one of the best in the country and I, I think again they're going to simplify so much of what they do, I think, and just try to lean a little more on the talent that they have. And especially when it comes to the offensive side of the ball, I, I think that that's a huge deal because this is an offense that I think should be pretty talented. Yeah. Okay. Um, so who do you have then, Shahan, at 12? Or sorry, at 11. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> so... This, of course, the uh, the conversation that that we need to have, and that's the Colorado Buffaloes, and they are so hard to figure out because <laughs> this, this is a team that I mean they went from one and eight in conference play under Carl Durrell to one and eight in conference play under Deion Sanders. They also made a lot of noise. They also had moments where they should have won other games that they didn't end up winning. You know, whether it's that Stanford game, uh, they they gave Utah quite a bit of hell last year, probably one of their more impressive games of the year. And at the same time, ended the year on, on I believe, a five-game losing streak. So uh, they also could have lost to Arizona State and finished with zero conference losses. Like, it, it's just such a hard team. And then you take all of that and you eliminate basically everything that we know about this team because uh, because they brought in like 50-plus new transfers to deal with it. And I mean, the, the existential question of Colorado, and like I said, this this tier is is teams that certainly can jump up and, and get into the eight or nine win mark if some things go right for them. But like, can you start from scratch on the offensive line in college football? Like, can you do that? They tried that last year and it was worse than the offensive line that they had two years ago under Carl Durrell in a lot of ways. So it's just such a tough situation to try to figure out. Of course, they do also have arguably the best quarterback and arguably the best overall player in the big 12. I'm not saying that they are, but they have a case certainly. And so like, I don't know, man, they also gave themselves a hell of a schedule with North Dakota state as the opener at Nebraska. And then that rivalry game on the road against Colorado state. So they had a blessed existence through the first three weeks of the year last year. There's certainly a <laughs> chance that it's the opposite this year. So I don't know, man. I, I actually, when I went through and did my game by game predictions, I actually had them finishing with the 12th best record behind Baylor. I, I flip flop those. Cause I think that Colorado probably has a little bit of a higher floor right now than Baylor has, but who the heck knows, man, this is going to be such a weird year. Yeah. I, I have Colorado at 10 and it's kind of the same sort of thing. Like this is a team that, has enough talented guys at key positions 
that they could shock a lot of people and do a lot of good stuff. Um, kind of like last year, right? Where like they had enough there that they they surprised people early. And now, granted, I think part of that was that they played against some teams that weren't quite ready for them or or weren't quite as good as we thought that they were. Um, but I think this is also yeah, yeah, both of those. Um, but but I think this is also a case where, you know, I don't know that they have enough key pieces across the entire defense, across the entire offense for you to expect any kind of consistency. So the real question is, are they going to be really good and they're going to catch a lot of teams at their absolute worst and take advantage and be a good, you know, show up as a good team on paper because they happen to be extremely lucky or are they going to hit every team that is, you know, kind of at their peak and it's going to be a struggle every single time. Like Shutter Sanders is a great quarterback. I, I, I disagree with him being, you know, the, the preseason, uh, the offensive player of the year in the big 12. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the preseason quarterback first team, because he definitely was not the offensive player of the year, but um, like, I don't think he's the best quarterback in the big 12, but he's, but he's like up there in that, in that top tier. And they have multiple other guys like that, that are like worthy of being considered some of the best at their individual position. But a lot of those are skill guys. They don't have the trenches. They don't have what they need to consistently be good across the course of an entire season. So I do think that you're going to have times where, yeah, they're flashy as hell. They're going to, you know, impress a lot of people with particular plays or maybe small stretches of plays. But if you look over the course of the entire season, I just, I don't expect Colorado to put together a very good, you know, overall resume or make a push or anything for the top half of the conference. I mean, it's possible. I don't expect it. Um, there's enough variance there that I think it's probably more likely that they could jump up than a team like Baylor or, you know, who I have at 11. I have at 10 as well. I do think they have improved their roster. Like I do think he brought in players that from a starter standpoint, the roster is better this year than it was last year, including, especially on defense. Like I really think they improved that defensive roster a lot. The depth still, not there i mean it's a little bit better because you kept some guys but you still ran a bunch you still had a bunch of guys leave so it's not like you brought in a better players and stacked them on top of the guys you had you still had guys leave so i do think the top of the talent is improved depth's what's going to kill them on the back end the other concern for colorado is you're not going to catch anyone sleeping you're not going to get anyone's worst game like Shadur isn't wrong when he said we're everyone's Super Bowl. Like saying Super Bowl is the wrong term, but the idea of like we're going to get everyone's best. Yes, you are because of how your your coach acts because of comments like that. You're you're not going to have anyone be like, oh, we're playing Colorado. We better take this game off. They're going if they're going to be like Oregon last year, looking for an opportunity to, to embarrass you just for fun. So like it's going to be tough for Colorado. I do think the team is better. I do think that yeah, we got to have questions about the offensive line. I do think the defensive line is better. I think the pieces they brought in yeah. there, I'm yeah. l- a lot less concerned on that trench well, than I am and, the offense. I think line. that I think that that's also much more of a plug and play position is finding yes. guys to to plug in on the defensive line. The issue with offensive line is that it's so much about communication, right? It's so much about chemistry and understanding scheme and I I mean the thing that probably also scares me most about this team is this is a new offensive coordinator, a new defensive coordinator, and a new offensive line coach, along with two other new uh, position coaches as well. So, like, I I just don't know if they exactly have the vision of what they want to be. And, um, and again, like, maybe their offensive line coach, Phil Lodeholt, maybe, like, he, he... uh, he he learned under Bill Biedenbaugh over at Oklahoma, like one of the best of all time, certainly. Maybe he's just going to bring it uh, and, and they'll be ready right away. But even I look at these games, again, North Dakota State, that's going to stress test your offensive line. Nebraska, that is absolutely going to stress test your offensive line. Um, I, I really look, I, I think that one of the most important games of the year in the Big 12 for both these programs is the week four game Colorado versus Baylor. One of these teams is going to emerge uh, kind of heading in a good direction in some ways. And I think the other might spiral if, if things really go the wrong way. And I, I don't know. I mean, and, and they they don't miss anybody, right? You get Kansas State, you get Utah, you get Kansas, you get Oklahoma State. Like, I guess you don't get Iowa State, but you go on the road to UCF, like you go on the road to Texas Tech. Like their schedule is really hard again. And if you told me, okay, well, they have three winnable games to open the year. 
I'm feeling so much better about where this thing is going. Fair, fair. Uh, okay. Who do you have at 10, Sean? I have Texas Tech. Um, I, th- I think these next two teams, uh, so, so Texas Tech at 10, TCU at 9. I kind of went back and forth with them. I, I believe that that uh, that Texas Tech plays TCU on the road, which was part of, I think, why it ended up just being falling the way that it did. Um, you know, look, I, I actually think that the job that Jelly Maguire has done so far is actually getting a little underrated because of the expectations that they had heading into last year. Texas Tech had not won or put together consecutive winning seasons in Big 12 play since Mike Leach left in 2009. Like, it it hadn't happened, and he did it over the last two years. They lose those non-conference games, of course, and that makes the record not look as impressive. But, like, if if you replace those two, and and this isn't how football works, but if if you replace those two with wins, right, like, we're talking about an eight-win regular season team. Uh, after going five and four in conference play. So I do think that this this uh, team is in a good place. Um, you know, they bring back some good uh, experience on the offensive line. I, I, I'm curious if they're going to be able to keep Baron Morton healthy. That's been a cursed position for them at the quarterback position over the past couple of years. And I don't love what they have waiting in the wings right now with Jake Strong as a, as a really young player, especially. But they've done a good job of trying to figure things out over the past couple of years. So like I said, I mean, I mean, I think that they're in this group, but with a chance to move up as well. Yeah. For me, I have Texas tech at nine. Um, and for me, I think it's a combination of, you know, Joey McGuire and what he's shown the last couple of years of adjusting on the fly and things not falling apart when everything goes to crap. Um, and I just think that Texas tech has, uh, you know, I, I do think that they have, enough enough improvement and enough kind of shown improvement over the course of the last couple of years to to think that they can take that next step again tough big 12 conference like their schedule again it doesn't really do them any favors um you know like i mean maybe like you look at the non-conference that game at washington state i'm not really sure what to think about that one um because washington state is i mean they're not like you know top of of uh or they weren't top of the pac 12 last year but they were at least a respectable pac 12 team last year they lost a lot though i, I will well, say they lost a fair. crazy amount yeah no and and, the, and that situation. is fair but i but also they're, think they're still going to be one of the two best teams in the pac 12 this year yes so. exactly exactly <laughs> <laughs> but all right they they will likely likely be you know well maybe not top half of the pac 12 we'll see um but <laughs> i think they'll be I, well actually that's that's a good question <laughs> we'll, we'll good save question. for the pack two preview yeah yeah exactly but no i mean i just i just think that texas tech at this point um i think has has a better i, I think opportunity here for everything to kind of hit their stride i i don't know what to make of i mean in comparing to tcu who i have at 11 like i don't know what to make of this tcu team because it was going so well you know you know, they, they had a the phenomenal run to the college football playoff to the to the championship game and then everything fell apart. And I understand they lost a lot of stuff, but they I know I know that they felt and I know that a lot of people kind of around college football felt that they replaced it with really good talent and that they were not expecting a huge drop, like a small drop off, of course, but not that huge drop off that we saw last year. And while they seemed to kind of steady the ship at the end at the end of the year. I don't, I don't know what to expect from this defense. I don't know what to expect from this offense from TCU. And so I, I trust Texas Tech a little bit more with what they have. I feel like I know a little bit more about what they have as opposed to with TCU. Um, you know, I think they could have a good year, but I, I don't know enough about the guys that they have to feel confident that they're going to be able to. I have Texas Tech at nine as well, but I have TCU down at 12. And I'll do TCU first. We keep talking about having to, you know, rebuild a, a tra- an offensive line to the transfer portal like Colorado's doing. And at this point, you should know as anybody, like, you can't rebuild an offensive line to the portal. You, you can supplement some pieces, but you cannot rebuild an offensive line to the portal. And I think TCU's basically having to rebuild their offensive line through the transfer portal with all the guys that they had to bring in on that offensive line. And that concerns me a lot, um, especially when you have a guy like Josh Hoover who's not. A runner like he is not a dual threat that's not the kind of quarterback he is and not just that like y'all that oc decision last year we can 
point at quarterback change and the pieces they lost and no Quentin Johnson. That's fine. That's wrong. The juice wasn't worth the squeeze, in my opinion. And so I'm not like, it, it's going to be better this year. Like, I am – I TCU should be better this year, but I don't know that they're going to be significantly better this year. And the offensive line scares me. And now, look, their schedule isn't daunting. Like, at Stanford, who knows? Uh, SMU, you know, well, they're a power four team now. Um, they get Houston at home. They go to Cincinnati. They go to Baylor. But like Texas Tech to me, and I understand all the concerns about Baron Morton. I have said since he got hired, like year three is the year for Joey McGuire. If it's going to pop, that's when it should pop. And he's got his players in there. The talent levels continued to climb. Obviously, you have the quarterback question. I'd hate playing the schedule game, but folks, Texas Tech could start the season five and up between Abilene, Wazoo, who lost everything. North Texas, Arizona State, Cincinnati, they could be 5-0 and heading to Arizona in week six. And if Texas Tech, to me, gets that, and I understand this is the biggest if possible. If they, and this is why I included Baron Morton in my, like, important players last night. If they actually were to keep a starting quarterback healthy for a season and you built momentum like that, because, again, I think Texas Tech's team last year was better than they actually ended up being. You, you, you blow that game at Wyoming. You blow a lead against Oregon. Like, Texas Tech had those games, as you mentioned. I think Texas Tech, this is the year they take that step forward. I'm not saying they're going to get to Arlington. I still think they have some things they've got to figure out. And I, but you've got Taj Brooks, and he's he's real good. I think there's enough weapons on this team. I I, I had to put them higher. Like I, I, Texas Tech to me is at the tail end at nine of my like teams. I will consider contenders, for, Ar- for, yeah. contenders for Arlington. Once we get to Colorado at 10 and down, um, I don't think you're going to be there, but no, I will. And that's take fair. The Texas I like Tech, as weird as the schedule is, and I think their schedule in conference play is manageable enough, and if they start hot like they could there, that that's a team that could find themselves at the end of the year needing uh, a win over – what's the final games in the schedule? Uh, having West to go Virginia. to OSU at home for West Virginia away for potentially getting into Arlington. Like, I, I just – I think that opportunity is there in year three for Joey McGuire with what all they have built. Well, and, and I, I also think just kind of given, you know, having Taj Brooks is that steadying factor for the offense – where if something does happen with Baron Morton, you have a really good running game that you can rely on. They have an offensive line that is set up well, that they can go and work with that running game as kind of the steadying factor for a week or two while they try to figure out what to do quarterback wise. So yeah, I think that, I think that there's, there's a much lower variance for a Texas tech team than there is for most of the other teams kind of in this range here because of what they have there. Well, I, I, so, okay, there's two pieces to this. One, I so I, I usually agree that rebuilds tend to be three-year cycles, right? But I think from my perspective, there's a couple things working against that for, for Texas Tech. One is, I mean, they have been so high school recruiting heavy for, on purpose, of course, right? So the first real full high school recruiting class that Joey McGuire brought in was the class of 2023, and it was the number 28 class in the country, one of the best classes that Texas Tech has brought in in a very, very long time. But, you know, these kids are only going to be sophomores, right? And and the, the class they just brought in, first top 25 class in a very, very, very long time. These kids are going to be freshmen. And so I, I think that they've almost been able to find this balance of rebuilding on the fly while still having good players to lean on. So, you know, to me, I think that it's more... 25 maybe even as far as 26 that you're really looking as like the peak i mean i think the the peak 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 is when micah hudson the the superstar wide receiver is is more of like a junior type player because i think the thing right now is that todge brooks coming back just raises their floor so much there's no question about it they have an experienced offensive line which helps defensively they've got some weapons but I, I don't know if they have game changers necessarily on the defensive side of the ball it's more of a high floor unit so I, I think that they to me just don't have as quite the same level of up variance and look some of this some of this is in the eye of the beholder of what you see of that 2023 TCU season right because 
everything that went well in 2022 kind of went to hell in 2023. And I think that some of that I'm just willing to write off as like, wow, that sucked. You know, like, wow, that was a weird thing that happened. If I think even just losing that Colorado game in week one and kind of defining your season in so many ways off that game, I, I don't think they ever fully recovered from that, right? Like, I see, I mean, I look at their schedule last year, right? Three-point loss to West Virginia, seven-point loss to Texas Tech, three-point loss to Texas, one that people are going to remember for a long time, that that three-point loss against Colorado. Things really swung the opposite direction of the close game luck in 2023 because they were so inexperienced and dealt with some injuries. Now, the offensive line thing, absolutely real. I do think that they have guys who have been in their system who – like, 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 I I don't think that, for example, the floor of the guys who were there is as low as what it was for, like, Colorado, right? Like, I, I think that they could have put together a reasonable unit. I look at a player like Mike Nichols, who is coming back. He, he wasn't a bad player for them last year. Um, and I think that the other piece when it comes to TCU is, like, they just have – a much higher end of skill talent than what I think Texas tech has at this point. Now, you know, there's some guys that I like at Texas tech, but uh, a lot of the best skill talent that Texas tech has outside of Todd Brooks is really young. And Savion Williams is a known commodity. JP Richardson is a known commodity. Like you get Jojo Earl for another year in the system. Dylan Wright is an older player transferring in from Minnesota. And so like, I, I just think that offensively they have a lot more help. Uh, just talent-wise and what Texas Tech has. And the other thing that I have heard a lot from people around TCU is that Andy Avalos has been a revelation on the defensive side of the ball. He, you know, he really, I think uh, people are excited about what he's brought. Some people that I talk to are like, yeah, to be honest, we're going to be good defensively and offensively. We're going to have to figure some things out. Like they're more worried about the offense than the defense whenever I talk to people. And if that's the case, like if, if they end up being like an above average defense, like I, I think their offense can figure some stuff out. Like you said, I not the, not the guy necessarily offensively uh, who I'd want leading your team, right? I, I think that more than anything and, and putting all the other stuff aside, like I think that it's a system that just hasn't seemed to work very well. I, I would really, uh, you know, I think it's one that's been figured out in a lot of ways, but talent wise, they have a lot to work with there. And I think that just gives them a little bit of a higher ceiling, even though they absolutely have a lower floor than Texas Tech. All right. So we are about an hour in and at the halfway. (laughs) So. Yeah, uh, I literally just had to tell my wife, hey, I think we're going to be a lot longer than I thought. So well, we will try and move this along. All right. So uh, (laughs) uh, Shahan, number eight, who do you have? Yeah, number eight, I've got UCF. Uh, So for me, they are a team. This is when you start getting into, like, to me, yeah, like the legit, okay, they should be in the race heading into November to get to Arlington. And uh, so UCF last year, they finished six and seven. It was actually the first losing season of the Gus Malzahn era, or or, or, uh, sorry, uh, that Gus Malzahn has ever had as a head coach, which is a crazy stat to think about. That's something that every UCF person told me. Um, And they, I think, just continue to stock up, right? RJ Harvey coming back at running back, Kobe Hudson at wide receiver. They bring in KJ Jefferson. Uh, they really like what they have on the defensive line. Similar to kind of what we were talking about with TCU and Colorado, it's really about this offensive line. Is this offensive line ready to to be a mauling type unit? Of course, they can do the misdirection stuff that only gets you so far when you're playing good teams. But if it is, like, let's just say that they have an above average offensive line unit. This is a team that absolutely could finish, you know, top three in the in the Big Twelve if some things break right for them. So, uh, to me, they're they're a high upside pick. Yeah, I think UCF, I think, easily has one of the best running back rooms in the conference. And so country, man, country. Well, yes, yeah. yes. I, yeah. Sorry. I, I, uh, I get, I get slapped down quite a bit for making those kind of br- grand pronouncements, you know, being a big, well, I'm a national before. guy, so I can say exactly <laughs> national guy le- lends some credence to it, but no, I mean, yeah, UCF fantastic running back room. Like you said, offensive line is the real question, but you look around the rest of that team. It looks like a, a solid team that, you know, maybe just doesn't have the overall depth. I think that you would need to be super competitive in the big 12 throughout the course of the entire season. 
that's really the mo- the main issue I have UCF wise uh, would would be depth. I have them at seven. Um, you know, again, it's another one where they're kind of interchangeable with some of the teams around them. But I definitely think that UCF is one of those teams that will finish in the top half of the conference, could potentially make a push, be you know in contention going into you know the last three weeks of the season. And it just matters how things break for them to have maybe an outside shot of sneaking their way into Arlington. Um, again, I wouldn't pick it, but I do think that it's at least a possibility. And the fact that we're talking about, you know, the fact that, that UCF could be a conference title contender in the Big 12 is a, is a pretty big deal. I have them at four. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, that's too high, man. That's too high. I'm sorry. That's too high. I know. Yeah. I know. But I, I, and, and I have said they're my dark horse for a while. And I finally was just like, look, you know what? This exercise doesn't matter at the end of the day because it's whatever. And so I can do whatever I want. And I didn't submit for the uh, Big 12 poll this year. But they gave us like five days to do it. I just like missed the email. So I didn't actually do it either. They didn't. I, if I got the email, I know I didn't apply for credentials this year, but I didn't apply yeah. for credentials last year. They sent it to me. So I was like, I thought I was, anyways, <laughs> uh, I get it. And I, and I send, understand, and I get it. This is my, whatever you think is going to happen in the big 12 is wrong. And someone's going to be up there. That's not supposed to. And that's how highly I think of KJ Jefferson is in Gus Malzahn system. And that's how highly I think of RJ Harvey and having Penny Boone, like that, that I get the offensive line concerns, but kind of like the conversation with Baylor of like, good thing they got into Quan Finn because that can help with your questions about offensive line. Like KJ Jefferson solves that problem for UCS offensive line as well. And also, by the way, you I mean, you talked about best running back rooms in the Big 12. That's one of or in the big in the country. Like that's one of like three off that three in the country. Like the big 12 is so loaded at running back. We could talk about Kansas state. We could talk about West Virginia, like great running back rooms that are in the big 12. It's ridiculous. I just, I, and I understand that a lot of defenses in the big 12, like coaches understand this is the year, the running back, they're going to load up. You're talking about Iowa state having a a four man defensive front this year, which is just a mind boggling thing because they understand that that's where their strength lies. And also guess what? The running backs are going to be really good in the big 12 this year. We're going to stop the run. I am I understand the negatives on UCF. I have just decided that I'm going to take my UCF ticket and and kind of ride this my dark horse and think they're going to do really well this year. I think they were so close in some games last year that now that they've got that experience in in being in the P5 conference and because they are so much they they are established as a program they didn't have a head coaching change. They haven't had the issues that BYU does with Russ or like I I'm going to ride the BYU is going to have their kind of breakthrough season. So I put them at four. So this is your uh, equivalent of Kansas going bowling in 2022, you know, bold prediction. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, that that's, was me that's back wrong. in 2022, by the way. I'm so just saying that. Yeah. Utah UCF at the end of the regular season is going to impact who gets to Arlington. I'm going to put that right there. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, if Utah that, loses sure. the game, if Utah loses the game, sure, then maybe it'll impact whether they go to Arlington or whether, you know, which locker room they're in, maybe. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm going to move on to my number seven, uh, yes, West, West Virginia. So this is a this is a tough team for me to really, like, fully evaluate, right? Because I think that so much of it, if they're going to take that step, it's going to come down to whether essentially can Garrett Green hit layups, man. Like, can he hit layups? He's so good at hitting threes. Can he hit layups? That was su- such a big part of what they did last season. I mean, when you look at his advanced stats, right? Like, you start looking and it's like, oh, he averages like nine and a half yards for pass attempt and he completes 52% of his passes. And he has like an amazing like rating on, on throws downfield. And he's one of the worst intermediate throwers in the entire country. Like, Hit some layups, man. Hit some layups. Because if you hit some layups and down to down, you're more, uh, you know, you're you're more consistent. So much is here for West Virginia. Like they started to figure out some stuff in the run game last year. I, you know, CJ Jonathan and, and Jaheim White. It, it's just incredible uh, what they have in that backfield. They brought more back on the offensive line than expected, which I think is a really big deal. Even though they lost Zach Frazier, and defensively. I mean, they they weren't good last year, but they were really like situationally excellent. And I think that they'll be able to take potentially even another step in 2024. So 
I mean, yeah, because like another another credit you have to give them is that like they mostly didn't just escape one score games. They did a pretty good job of putting teams away as well. It wasn't just close game luck. They kind of went 50-50 in those close games. So I, I think that there's some upside here, but a lot of it I think comes down to whether Garrett Green can kind of take that step. Yeah, for me, I, I had them at eight. And for me, I still don't trust Neil Brown as the head coach. Like, <laughs> I mean, I understand that there yeah. was a, a fair. I can't say it anymore. I think them last. So I, I, I just have to I just have to yeah. defer to him. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I still think like what I saw last year wasn't even necessarily a, hey, Neil Brown took a huge step forward with this team. It was more of a everything had gone so bad poorly for them that it was bound to like you know even out at some point um i mean you still saw some really bad performances i mean you look at that houston game you know the way that they uh you know threw that one away last year um i, I just think that this is a west virginia team while they are improved and i definitely think that they are you know middle of the pack and have an opportunity if everything goes well i don't know that i trust neil brown to be the one to get the best out of this team compared to some of the other teams and the other coaches that are in this conference. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm just looking at, you know, looking at my, my own personal coach rankings and Neil Brown's not in the top half, I don't think. And uh, which is kind of saying something with, with, with a lot of the new coaches that are in here. So, um, you know, I, I am worried about this West Virginia team, but they have a ton of talent. So it's, it's, it's hard to be too worried about them. I do think that they're going to pull off some upsets. I do think they're going to have a decent year and I, think that Neil Brown's going to do enough, you know, that we're not even considering him potentially losing his job, but you have to remember how close he was to getting run out of town last year. Um, you know, fairly early in the season or uh, no, like as the season went on, he was fine. But like the beginning of the season, like it was a, Hey, you better win quickly. Like right now, or we may throw you out by game two. That, that, that buyout was real big. This is a big buyout. Right, um, right. Like, I, it, basically, I, he got saved by the fact that his buyout was gigantic. I think you guys have said, I mean, look, I have them at, at eight as well. Um, I see the upside there. The schedule is not easy. I don't think anyone's schedule is easy in the Big 12. I think it's a manageable schedule. Uh, that Penn State game in week one is, oh, man. Oh, it. That uh, this is what I'll say. You guys have said a lot of great stuff. I, I, the potential is there for West Virginia. Like I can see the path for them having a breakthrough year. And a lot of it, as, as Shahan said, and it has been said on the show the past few nights, is relies on Garrett Green taking a step forward as a passer. If they find a way to beat Penn State in week one at home, there will not be a more important win for the Big 12 and non-conference than that one. And so we are all, we are all ears <laughs> in week one. West Virginia, it's Penn State. I don't care how, what you're – I don't care. Just if you're a Big 12 fan, like, go gold and blue. Yeah, but the the only other thing I'll say is, I mean, look at that beginning Big 12 schedule for them. Against Kansas, at Oklahoma State, against ISU, against KSU, and then at Arizona. Brutal five-game stretch to start the conference play. It's not – it's – yeah. It, well, again, we thought last year they had the most difficult schedule in the Big 12, and – um it didn't. So, you know, I, I learned my lesson after last year. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, K Ford, I love you and your and your uh, schedule, strength schedule rankings. Okay, number. <laughs> uh, what about I'm on to seven? six now. Six yeah, hit so, six. Yeah, 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 hit it. So, so this is where I start to transition into like the to me the true contenders, and with number six, I'm going with Arizona. So. They trying to sort through, I'll say two to six was the hardest part of this entire exercise. I actually, when I picked them, I believe that two through four, I all had finishing with the same record in conference play with a, with five and six, one game back. So that's just the kind of season that this has the potential to be. So Arizona, I, I mean, they won 10 games last year. They were one of the best teams in the Pac-12, one of the best stories in the country, um, I'm actually not super concerned about the actual coaching change. I think that Brent Brennan has come in and fit really well and tried to, to keep as much consistency as possible with this program. And by the way, they have the best quarterback to wide receiver combo 
certainly in the Big 12, I mean, maybe in college football, it is like that that Noah Fafita to Tetroy McMillan connection is going to be disgusting. I got a chance to talk to both of them when we were at Big 12 Media Days. And um, I mean, they are just like on the same page, man. They can read each other's minds, essentially. So, so they're going to be a lot of fun to watch. And I love the back of their defense. Uh, I mean, Takario Davis coming back at cornerback. I love the the group that they have back there. The question for me is going to be, can they still be excellent up front defensively? Because they lost some really good players, a couple of them to Texas who followed Johnny Nansen, the, the former defensive coordinator. I, I don't know if that's plug and play, if, if you can just assume that they're going to continue to be great there. Because this was... I mean, the thing that changed about this team to take them to 10 wins was their defense in a lot of ways. And offensively, they did a lot of nice things, but that wasn't what carried them. I don't know if they're going to be quite as excellent this year on the defensive side of the ball. They'll be good, but I don't know if they'll be one of the better defenses in the Big 12. So, um, you know, certainly, certainly uh, I I do hope that I'm wrong because I I would love to see this team and what they do offensively have a chance to play in Arlington. But that's what put them just like, the smallest of steps behind the five I have above of them. Yeah. I mean, I have Arizona at five. Um, and I think kind of to your point, the fact that they were able to retain so much after the coaching change, I think is a huge, a huge deal for them. Um, I do think that they do kind of to your point, have a few issues on defense, but I look across the big 12 and it's hard to find a defense that doesn't have, you know, one issue that could potentially be the unraveling. So like, if that's the, you know, if that's what, what we're comparing, like, I I don't, I don't know that they necessarily have such a big issue there that I'm uncomfortable putting them, you know, up in the top five. But um, I I do wonder though, just how much they have in terms of, uh, you know, potential options. Like, yes, they have a fantastic number one connection there. But I don't, I don't know if the rest of the offense is as dynamic as some of the other teams that are going to be up, you know, above them um, in my rankings. And so I am, I am definitely a little worried about their ability to beat a lot of these teams. But I do think that they're extremely helped by the fact that they don't have to face Kansas State as actually part of the official, you know, Big Twelve rankings. So that that mean, or Big Big Twelve standings. So that that definitely helps them at least somewhat. Um, I still think it's going to be a really, really good team. This is a team that I could see. In Arlington, but uh, you know, I, I would say probably the top five in my rankings are one are teams that I could legitimately see in Arlington, um, and and so I have them there at number five. I have them at six. Um, I'm glad that you're high on the Brent Brennan move. I think this is one of those like it will be less impactful in year one than it will be moving forward. Like I I don't have a good enough gauge on how good or bad a job San Jose State is. Oh, terrible, have- terrible. I, I okay. got a chance to go to, uh, uh, my wife is from San Jose, so I've gotten a chance to go by that school. And um, I, it's hard to think of a school that could care less about football. Like it is, it is a commuter school. Okay. It, nobody cares. Uh, I like, wh- whenever, whenever they had that good season, when Nick Starkle was the quarterback, I got texts like, I, I didn't even realize that that uh, that San Jose State had like a real football team like that. Like it is that kind of school. They do not care. So it is it's a terrible job and credit to him for getting out. OK, so that that helps because a part of it was like, Which, I'm not to be like clear, San Jose and... State fans, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> Just come on. Come on. Yeah, I got a lot. We got a very large San Jose State contingent <laughs> that loves the Big 12. I just like part, it's it's hard to judge Brent Brennan some because it was just hard to be like, is this a like, I don't know. They've now have a history of success. So um, again, Arizona's I'm the, the further into the off season we get, the less I think Arizona is making it to Arlington. I just, I know that Kansas state's not account against them from the standings, but the schedules and the schedule's not the worst schedule. I just, like Noah Fafita could have one of those seasons. I remind Noah Fafita to me could have the season that like um, this last night. I couldn't remember his name. Uh, uh, Lamar Jackson had where like Louisville has this incredible season because Lamar Jackson just puts Louisville on his back and carries them to like ten wins. Like I could see that kind of performance from Fafita with Arizona this year. I just like I think the losses that they took both to the transfer portal and the NFL are really concerning. And so I need to see that they have been able to replace some of those pieces 
enough for me to be high enough on them to think like I, I again six i think they're gonna be good to team like that's but that's how good fafita is um and i like the running back addition out of the transfer portal we talked about him on sunday when we did the live show i like jacory krosky merritt from new mexico i i, I think he's a, really, a sneaky good running back and is going to be a nice running back for them so uh i don't think they're gonna be bad but i am i'm i'm less sold on them as an actual like getting to early i can see the path oh. I'm just not sold on. I was to say the thing that I'll say though is you look at their at their schedule, and again, the fact that that Kansas State game does not count in them getting to Arlington is absolutely crucial because the only other game I look at, I'm like, oh yeah, they you know there's a very good chance they lose that game, but it's the game at Utah to start conference play. Um, they should be favored in every other game that they have the rest of the year, except for maybe at UCF, depending on how UCF's playing at that yeah. point. And so, you know, if they're a team that is you know, eight and one in conference, that's probably going to get them very strong consideration to Arlington. And they may end up having, you know, their tiebreaker. If there's four teams at eight and one, the fact that they potentially lose a game to Utah at the beginning of the year, you know, could be what keeps them out of Arlington. But I have a hard time with them not being a team that is right there. And if they don't go, it's probably because of tiebreakers. Yeah. And and I just think that with the, with how competitive this conference is, like, the, the second team to me is very clearly going to have two or three losses. Like they are. I, I mean, I, I had, uh, I had, I think three teams with seven and two in conference play. I think that six and three is not impossible. Uh, in fact, did a, I'm trying to think, I think Oklahoma state finished seven and two last year, if I remember right. But, um, but you know, like this is going to be a competitive league and it wouldn't be a shock to see some team uh, at six and three potentially move up. I, but I, I think they absolutely have that pathway to being seven and two or better and having a chance. Um, I, again, I'm not picking it. That's why there's six, but I think that it's there. Uh, okay. So five, Shahan. Yeah. Every, every spot I move up gets harder to, to decide. Um, so I went with Oklahoma state at five and Oklahoma state again, like they, they are a tough like <laughs> they're real tough to truly figure out because statistically defensively they were terrible last year but they kind of did the Jim Knowles thing of like when it's time to put up or shut up they were really good in the second half of games they were situationally excellent um and, and of course they were able to hang on to the ball because Ollie Gordon is just that kind of player and they rank among the national leaders in returning production I think that they're sixth nationally um they have the most reliable option in the big 12 at uh, with Ollie Gordon at running back. Who's just going to be able to put games on his back for long stretches. They have a quarterback who is good enough, right? Like who, who's proven that he can, uh, you know, not cost you situations or games and, and a receiver and Brennan Presley, who I think has a chance to be pretty special. Th- they had a very, fortunate ride through the big 12 last year they they won a lot of close games they managed to keep things close obviously oklahoma fans will literally talk for the next you know 50 years about that call at the end of that game and i think that's hilarious um and so the the i think there's two questions of this one will they be able to replicate some of that close game luck but two are they going to be improved enough that it doesn't matter I think they will definitely be improved with the amount that they bring back, especially in year two under Brian Nardo on the defensive side of the ball. But I just feel a, just slightly less confident in them compared to my top four. Yeah. So Oklahoma state, I have at four um, again. Um, I, I do think if you have something to worry about on the offense, not not worry, but I should say the thing you're least confident in is probably Alan Bowman at quarterback. Um, while, while he was he was serviceable last year, he was pretty good towards the end of the year. Like there were some really rough spots, and the fact that it took so long for him to actually kind of take the reins there. I mean, I'm sorry, but any season that you have multiple games where you are rotating three quarterbacks inside of a single game. Um, you have quarterback issues, even if you figure it out by the end of the year. So I, I do think that this is a team that, like like Shayan said, they were very fortunate with a lot of what happened last year for them. So, um, you know, they had, a, they had a couple opponents that completely fell apart down the stretch, Kansas included. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, if you play those games 10 times, they probably lose those games, you know, six or seven of those times. So I, I think that they 
they got a lot of bounces to go their way last year. I don't know if they're going to quite have the same the same bounces, but they have a really good set of skill position players um, on the offensive side. I, I wonder defensively how everything's going to come together because they gave up a ton of points last year. Um, I'm curious if they're going to do the same or if they're going to actually take a huge step forward here defensively. I just, I, that's probably where I'm one or I, I have the biggest questions. All right. Call me a homer. Now I have them at two. Uh, here's the deal. If you're going to, Mike Gundy just wins one score games. Like his record is the antithesis of Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell can't win them. Mike Gundy wins most of them every single year. And so I get it. Uh, yeah. I took the out state shot. It's, it's, I was like, careful. Fancy's going to come for you in the comments. That's fine. I see you fancy. Uh, look, you're not wrong on on Bowman being the biggest concern. And I think it's not just Brennan Presley. Like, I, I think OSU's wide receiving core is underrated this year. I really do. Um, I'm, I, I think the defense should take a step forward. They're adjusting back to a four-man front. Um, Colin Oliver's going to tear people alive. It's going to be a beautiful thing. I just I, – I think that – if you look at the schedule for OSU, the first six games of the season are really going to decide it. It is tough. Like South Dakota State, Arkansas at Tulsa. Then you do Utah at K-State, West Virginia before your first week off. The back half is not so bad. At BYU, at Baylor, ASU, at Texas, or at TCU, Texas Tech at Colorado. Like if OSU can survive that first opening stretch, like they're going to lose a game they shouldn't because Mike Gundy always loses a game that he shouldn't lose. But I, I really do think that the opportunity is there. You're not going to have the slow start you had last year because you've got all this stuff established. You, I don't expect the offensive line to stay healthy, but they basically returned their like eight deep, nine deep. It's like Kansas State was last year, right? They had turned like every offensive lineman they had. OSU has that this year. And I, I know that last year they all stayed healthy, which is really not what OSU's offensive line has done for the previous years before that. I just think that, I think OSU and I trust is going to be good enough has enough good pieces. The defense made enough adjustments in games last season that even though statistically they weren't good watching those games, they adjusted in second halves. Nardo did a really good job. It's his year too. I have enough belief that they will take enough of a step forward at various spots this year because of how much they had to re- had replaced last year. That is back this year that, I think OSU will be better. Won't have to play in as many one score games. They'll lose a one score game, but Gundy's really good in one score games. He just really is. And so like, I trust in close games. I'm way more like that. They're going to be able to win enough of them to get back to Arlington for a second year. I know it's not a good thing to pick teams to go back to Arlington and back to back seasons. The big, yeah, it doesn't happen. It doesn't doesn't happen unless you're named OU. But I'm gonna, ugh, I'm gonna do it. I'm just. I'm I was just saying, gonna way to go, Philip. You jinxed them. Good That's job. fine. Like, <laughs> well, here's my issue. Here's my issue, right? So, like you said, uh, they're gonna lose one, probably that they shouldn't lose. But my issue is more those first two. Like, the, they they play against Utah in, in their first Big Twelve game. I think that Utah should be like notably better than them, right? Like, and maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll be wrong. But let's say that Utah is notably better, goes on the road and wins. Well, then the very next week you go at Kansas State. I think that there's a good case that Oklahoma State it could be a better team than Kansas State, but it's on the road, right? Like, and and maybe you're just coming off of a loss. The fact, also by the way, that their their team is going to be stress tested physically with South Dakota State and Arkansas in the first two weeks. We might be talking about you know injuries already at this point. And let's just say that you lose those first two games. Well, if you think that they're going to lose a bad one somewhere else, like that's three losses right there, right? Like that's already potentially getting you out of Arlington if things go that way. And even if they split Utah and Kansas State, I I mean, like, I I just think that there's another loss in there most likely somewhere. And so I agree. Yes. You know, Mike Gundy tends to be very good in in one score games. Um, But like, again, like, in 2021 they ride you know some some really good production and close game luck to the title game the next year it doesn't as much go their way right they lose that game in double overtime against tcu they lose against west virginia late in the year they lose against wisconsin in the bowl game like 
even for teams that tend to be good in close games, it's hard to do it fully to that extent two years in a row. And like you said, I, I mean, if they if they split Utah and Kansas State, I think that they're in pretty good shape to be in contention heading into November. But I'm worried that they're going to lose both of them just because those teams are really, really good. And it's so hard to open uh, with those games back to back. And also, by the way, why do I, I mean, I, I guess it's I guess it's more of a service to their fans, but like why does Oklahoma state play so many group of five teams on the road? I, I just, and Tulsa is basically a home game. I get it. But like, it's just weird. Why are you doing that, man? Let, let your kids enjoy their stadium for a little bit. They've got two home games open season. Just go to Tulsa. Tulsa's a, a quick jaunt down the road. It's fine. No, I, I, I was going to say um, Oklahoma state is a team that, seems to me like they're a much better candidate to do like what Iowa state did after they went to the big 12 title game where, you know, they went to the big 12 title game on the back of a bunch of really close games, a bunch of really, <laughs> <COVID>. um, <laughs> well, yeah, that too, but, but no, but, but I mean, kind of, you know, there was a lot of things that went their way that you can't count on happening again. And I do think that close, like those close games over and over again, I mean, I, I still have them, you know, in the top four, which puts them right there in contention as well. So, like, and, I, I don't think it's crazy to think that they could get to Arlington, but I don't, I don't I, think, I think that. The, yeah, the other piece for me is like, what if Ollie Gordon gets hurt? Right? Like, what percent of this team's success is completely dependent on like that guy being awesome? Right? Like, over I, there with I mean, the don't can, you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby? No, but we can do like, what if Jalen Daniels gets hurt? What if Cam Rising gets hurt again? Well, like, but like, I, I think that I, I have much injury. better ideas of what might happen if those things happen. Right? Like, I, I, I Jalen Daniels is the one that I agree, and we're gonna get to that. Trust me. But like, I like the fact that that Utah brought in uh, uh, the the. The transfer, I'm like, oh, uh, uh, Sam Heward from uh, from Cal Poly, right? Like, who was a former five star. I like the fact that they have a backup plan. I don't know, like, if if Ollie isn't exactly what he was last year, I'm a little concerned about whether it's replicable, right? So, and I mean, he he is indestructible, man. I've I've been watching him since he was at Trinity Euless. Like that that dude is just indestructible in a lot of ways. But I think that they are also just so dependent on that that I, I I don't know. It, it gives me a little bit of pause versus some of the teams above them who I think have a bit more versatility available to them. That's fair. That's fine. Uh, shout out to Brian Metcalf, Kit Bennett, and Fancy Rex who are uh, watching and commenting right now. All right. Uh, I, I know you've got a sleeping kid and, and I do too. So uh, let's do four. What's he got for? Yeah. <sighs> like <laughs> Matt Campbell, can you, can you just, can you can you can you do the thing? Can you can you just like be serious and and do the thing? Because I think that your roster might be awesome, and I think that like you might have a young quarterback who I'm very excited about. And like, can can you do it, man? Can you not mess this up? I'm begging you. But people wrote off Iowa State so much last year after their non-conference play. Like uh, you know they start one and two, and but they they, they were competitive heading into November with a really, really, really young team. And the amount of like freshmen and sophomores that they have coming back, they're number one in the nation in returning production. They have some high upside guys. I look at those receivers, you know, Jaden Higgins was, was a beast last year for them. Jalen Noel, I, I think is a guy who's only going to continue to get better. Rocco Becht. I mean, and then I think, I think for them offensively, the swing player is going to be Abu Sama. Can he be more of a consistent down to down back? Cause if that happens like defensively, they should be awesome again, right? Like they should have a chance to be really good, especially on that back end uh, with, uh, with Jeremiah Cooper back, especially at safety. Like, Matt Campbell, man, can you can you can you do the thing? Can you do the thing? Like I really wanted to put them at number two. Like I really wanted to put them at number two, and it really is a Ooh. well. I, you're you're gonna like they're gonna ruin a close game, right? Like they're going to ruin a close game at some point, and that's going to cost them. But I think that this team might be good enough that they can overcome some of it. And the other thing too is that this is going to be one of the more dynamic offensive teams 
that Matt Campbell has had with the playmakers that they have outside. So I really feel like to me, I mean, I, I, I think I've talked about them enough this off season that you can't say that they're a dark horse team anymore. I think they're just a contender in my eyes, but I, I really think that this might be the team that kind of gets Matt Campbell like back into legitimate Arlington contention. Like the, the fact that they were able to rebound the way that they did after the Hunter Decker situation, after the gambling stuff, after four and eight, like they, they have just built their sort of next class. And when you look back at Iowa state as well and their rise, and you know, you can say obviously uh, some, the, the COVID situation is, is what it is, but like they built up that roster over the course of like three years to where, then in 2020, and it should have been in 2021, but they messed some close game stuff up. Like they they had an elite team that was stacked at every level of the field. And I think they're building towards that now. And so I I'm again, man, like don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Yeah. Um, by the way, you're both welcome because I'm gonna take all the Iowa State hate from this from this podcast. I have them at number six. The reason being. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I wonder Matt, Matt Campbell. I think what we have found mm-hmm. from Matt Campbell is that he's not quite as good as a lot of other coaches about letting his assistants do their job. Um, he is extremely loyal to a lot of guys who not don't necessarily do their job well. Um, and that's, you know, caused plenty of problems. So yes, fancy. I see you. Um, but <laughs> what I will say is, I mean, John Haycock's there. The defense is fantastic. That's that's really all you need to know. Uh, so it really just comes down to offensively. Uh, one thing we do need to talk about, and, and we don't necessarily need to talk about it here, but how is it that Matt Campbell keeps, like, failing upwards with his quarterbacks? Because, like, Brock Purdy came out of nowhere because a guy got injured, and all of a sudden, you know, he's a, a fantastic quarterback for them. And honestly, I wasn't sold on Hunter Deckers, um, you know, and, and they get Rocco Beck, who I think is honestly a much more equipped quarterback. Uh, especially for what they want to try to do. The question for me becomes, Shayon said, you know, they have a very multi-talented offense. What I don't know is, you know, the most successful Matt Campbell offenses and and the teams that he put together have been based on a very big bruising run and then a tight end who can, who can, you know, really kind of open up the field for the wide receivers and not saying that they don't, that, you know, they have, they usually have some pretty good wide receivers, but I don't know that they necessarily have the building blocks that they're used to for putting together a really good offense. And so I'm wondering where we are, you know, in this, in this big 12 with a lot of the teams that are kind of floating around and just how good some of those other offenses are, can they stack up with, you know, trying to make this, this type of lineup work? Don't worry, Andy. I had them at seven. I want to preface by Wait. saying, Oh I thought God. you already got all Y'all of them. Oh my God. Y'all are insane. Oh my God. No, just, just hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Let me, let me preface by saying this. I don't like doing ranking because tiering things makes more sense to me because the difference between like, to me, West Virginia at eight and UCF at four is not that big. It they they are very close together. Okay. It's a really thin sandwich. So it's not that I think that, Iowa State's that much farther down from everybody else. Like, I absolutely see a path for Iowa State, and I really do like what they have on this roster, and I do think they can have a really good season. I need Matt Campbell to break the trend. I made the joke a minute ago, but let me just go ahead and do this. Uh, One score games for Matt Campbell while the head coach at Iowa State. 2016 to 2023 one and four three and four four and two two and four four and two two and five one and six three and four the man cannot win close games and you have to win your one score games to get to arlington i I, like i i agree on like all things are supposed to balance out and equal out and yet they never quite seem to for campbell special teams look better last year and I would also be a whole lot higher on him if we weren't on the third offensive coordinator in three years and another internal promotion. So like, I, I, I like Iowa state. I really do see the path for them there. And it would not, if you told me they got to Arlington, it's not going to surprise me. Like it's not, I just, that's 
I, when I have to start stacking things up, I just feel a little bit, a little more questions about it. Yeah, I know. Blame the Rams fan, fans. <laughs> you get the guy, you finally promote the guy to OC and he's like, bye, I'm going to the NFL now. Thanks, Matt Campbell. I'd rather do that than be here at Ames another year. Uh, I, I like Iowa State this year. I really do. It's really hard for me to have picked like one through eight. Like I, I really so, did have a hard time. So, 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 okay. Let me read off a list of returning Big 12 members who finished with a better conference record than Iowa State last year. Oklahoma State. That's the list. And here's the thing is that they finished six and three in conference last year. And so for them to fall to seventh out of 16, you're picking them to regress pretty significantly. Right, like if they replicate what they were last year, and they weren't awesome in close games last year, which is why they weren't, of course, in Arlington, but they were fine. The other piece that I'll add to this is that, you know, Andy, you mentioned this is a team that has won a specific way historically, and last year was kind of bucking the trend for them. They were a heavier passing team because they were good, not great, running the ball between the tackles. And when you talk about a three and four record, which is improved for Matt Campbell in close games, I think that that's a big part of it is that they do more dynamic things than they've done in the past. When I think one of the reasons that uh, obviously uh, I would say, but I think you even look at like Nebraska, one of the reasons that I think that they've struggled so much in close games is because they are so dependent on game script. They're so dependent on winning a specific kind of way. Uh, you know, they want to hold on to the ball. They want to slow things down. They want a low scoring game. So if something dynamic happens on the other side of the ball, it's kind of over for them. Like that's kind of it. I think that this Iowa state team is substantially more dynamic offensively than they've ever been. Whether it is Abu Sama, who really might be good for one 30 yard run a game with what he's shown so far, whether it is with the receiver talent that they have, whether it is with the quarterback that they have, who can do a little something in the pocket. And so like, like, I, I just, I don't think that this is going to be a team that regresses from last year, especially with all that they bring back. And look, maybe they try. I mean, I think that probably the biggest piece of concern is is the lot of uh, the loss of Nate Shieldhouse like I think that he was a really smart offensive guy who managed to I think put guys in good positions and a lot's going to be on Taylor Mouser to to step up and and replace some of that um and you know and, and fancy does mention the offensive line yeah. not not a not a strength on this team absolutely it's a big part of why they couldn't run the ball so consistently between the tackles but they just have again when I look even back to the 2020 team right and some of the, the great teams that came before, you know, it is, hey, man, like, Brees Hall is the center of everything, and everything works off of that. I don't think that this is that kind of team. I think it's one where you can go a couple different directions with it, partially because they don't have that bruising running back, but also because I think that, you know, they've had one Alan Lazard before, but they haven't had two good receivers at the same time before, right? They've had Charlie Kolar before, but they haven't had a good tight end and a good set of receivers. I just think that they have the chance to be more uh, dynamic. And, and again, like, will it suddenly fix everything? No, I don't think so. But, you know, I, I think that if you're talking about them being in contention to get to seven and two in conference, which is, which is the goal, like, I think it's all there for them. All right. Yeah. I, I mean, well, uh, we're moving on. We're okay, moving on. Fine. It's we're we're, fine. we're moving on Andy. Uh, don't worry. Um, I'll find a way to backdoor it. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so we're at what? Number three, number three, number three, number three. Yeah. So I think that this team has as high a ceiling as any in the conference, but there's one swing piece of this that, <laughs> that puts them down at number three. Hey, I wonder who that is. <laughs> and that would be Jalen Daniels back. Uh, over the past two years, Kansas, of course, had Jason Bean back there who was able to replicate a lot of what Jalen Daniels did when he wasn't healthy. I don't think they have that guy this year. I I, I don't think that Cole Ballard is ready to, to be that. I, I hear they really like the freshman uh, Isaiah Marshall. I think his name is, Isaiah um, Marshall, Yep. but, but like he's a freshman, right? Like he's not ready to do Jalen Daniels things as yet, but if Jalen Daniels is healthy, this 
is one of the like this is this is maybe the best team in the conference. They they are stacked on offense. Devin Neal coming back for some reason. Like this dude should be playing in the NFL. I, I asked him a little bit about it, right? But like uh, you know, and he was like, if we're in the Big 12 title game next year, I don't want to think, wow, I'm in the NFL. I'm not a part of this, right? Like he's back. The the number of upperclassmen who are back at receiver as fifth year seniors is absurd. Bring back uh, Melo Dotson at, at DB, Kobe Bryant at DB. Like this, <laughs> this team is stacked, man. This team is so, so, so good. But they need that conductor who's going to be able to pull it all together. And Jalen Daniels has shown that, I mean, when he is healthy, he is one of the best quarterbacks in the entire country. And so that gets them to me right on the edge of being in the Big 12 title game. Like that that can get them, I think. But But I can't get them to number two without knowing what the backup plan is because Jalen Daniels is going to miss a game or two. And and the question is, are those going to be likely losses or are those going to be games that they can still play at a really high level? Yeah. So I, I do have Kansas at two um, shocker, but no, I mean, I, I think it really comes down to that, right? Like Isaiah Marshall, the way that they've been talking about it and the way he was even recruited is very similar to Jalen Daniels yes, when yes. Jalen Daniels was recruited a, a guy that a lot of people necessarily didn't, didn't really know what it was, but he has a lot of the same tools, a lot of the same. The main difference here, and you saw Jalen Daniels play as a true freshman under Les Miles, um, and oh my gosh, it was That was awful. a million years ago. It oh was awful. Um, but the rest of the roster was so bad that he did not have an opportunity to really do anything. The main difference here, and, and the way that I understand it, Isaiah Marshall – is the backup. He is the guy that is going to trot out there and they're going to, it's going to allow them to basically run the same sort of system with just a guy who's not quite as, you know, obviously not quite as experienced. Um, But because he has a lot of the same tools and they expect him to kind of fill that same sort of role. I do believe that he, if he was pressed into the backup role, while he would not anywhere be, you know, as successful as Jason Bean, he would be much more successful than a guy like Cole Ballard was last year, trying to step in as at, at that third stringer. Um, Mainly because, they don't have to change a lot to try to, you know, figure out how to deal with what he does well, as opposed to what Jalen Daniels does well. The other thing though, is, you know, Daniels, uh, it was, it was a combination, I think last year of, you know, the back kind of being all over the place. And they got to a point where Jason Bean was playing so well that like, if, if Daniels had to come back for the last three or four games of last year, he could have like, he, he might've been able to, or they, they, they might've thrown him out there if Jason Bean wasn't playing so well. And, and the fact that when they got to the point where, you know, they got to the Kansas State game, like Jalen Daniels was a little, you know, they had already made the decision at that point that, hey, we're probably not bringing him back for the, the rest of the year. We're going to let him take that redshirt year. We're going to let Jason Bean kind of finish out the year. And then Bean gets hurt against Texas Tech and Cole Ballard gets to play against Kansas State and almost pull off that victory there. Like this is a Kansas team that has enough surrounding the quarterback that I don't think this is a team that falls apart if the quarterback's gone. Like, I, I agree, they, they, their stealing takes a huge hit. Um, but I, I think you can say that about pretty much every team here. But what really stands out to me is you look at what they've done in the, in the recruiting and the transfer portal for those offensive and defensive lines. Like, the worry was offensive line, right? When you're losing Mike Nowitzki, um, you know, you lost Dominic Pooney. They brought in um, Bryce Foster, which allows Michael Ford to go back to guard where he is probably, you know, he has a chance to be playing at an all-conference level. At, at the guard position, like that's how highly they think of him as a guard. Um, but he was going to have to play center until they got Foster coming in. Um, you know, they, they got a couple different offensive tackle transfers. Like they have guys coming in to fill those positions and they have an offensive line coach who's a new offensive line coach for them, but a guy who is very well respected across, across all of college football. And he's a guy that I think can kind of pull that together. Um, you know, the defensive line, though, is where I'm. I'm honestly impressed with the way that they kind of address that. You have two really good preps in DJ Warner and Deca- and Dakeus Brinkley. You know, both four star guys, um, which you know is, is huge for for a team like Kansas to be able to pull those kind of guys in. And then you have you know additional guys coming through the transfer portal. You have um, you know Javier Derrett. Uh, you've got I mean a, a few other guys kind of coming in. You've got pieces there, and you're bringing back pieces. So Kansas has always though been defensively a team that deals with depth they have a lot better depth than a lot of teams and they're able to kind of rotate that depth in they're at the point now where that high level talent gives them an opportunity I I think a lot of people are sleeping on this defense Um, I I do think this is going to be a much better defense than a lot of people expect 
Granted, that's probably a little bit of Kansas bias talking just because I'm, I'm a Kansas guy. But I, I do honestly think that this is a, a, a defense that's been completely written off when they really shouldn't be. They're not going to be like, you know, top three defense in the conference or anything, but they should be a top half of the conference defense and at least be respectable. And if they lose, it's not going to be because, you know, they lost 57 to, you know, you know, 51 or something like that. It's not going to be a gigantic shootout, the likes of Texas Tech and Oklahoma. I have Kansas fifth. Um, three reasons. Number one, I'll believe Jalen Daniels will play a full season when Jalen Daniels plays a full season. I, like, I hate coming with that mindset, but there's enough history That's of injury fair. and back stuff is back stuff. Like it's, it's your back. Like it's going to bug you. Uh, number two, um, every time we talk about the backups, like oh, so-and-so will just hop in here is just Jason Bean slander to me and completely under stating how good he was last year for Kansas as he was the best backup in the big 12. Yes. I understand Avery Johnson was a backup at Kansas state. I don't care. Jason Bean was the best backup and to say like, well, anyone else could just come. We got a guy who plays just like him is just like completely ignoring how important it was that Jason Bean stayed another year to be able to be the backup last year. And number three, Jeff Grimes is a fine offensive coordinator. He is not cold Nicky. I'm sorry. You, it is a, it is a, even if it's small, it is a step back in offensive call at play caller that is going to have an impact this season. I'm, I'm not going to like, I'm sorry, but it is. And so I take all those three again, I see the path for Kansas getting there. Jalen Daniels is healthy the whole season. I'm with you. Kansas is going to be in Arlington. I really do think they will. That's got to happen. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to ride on that because I have, I have, that is asking me to rely on something that I have not physically, I have not seen that we have not seen during his tenure in Lawrence. The one thing I will say, Kansas has probably the most favorable big 12 conference schedule of any of the potential contenders um, just with who they play and where they play them. Um, I mean, you look at probably the two difficult games on their schedule are obviously at Kansas state and then a home game. Well, an arrowhead game against Iowa state. Other than that, like they should be favored in every other game and, and honestly quite handily in most of them. Mm, At West Virginia could get. Well, you know, yeah, I I, I think they will be favored probably not handily in that one, but yeah, I, I, I get your point. Agree. Uh, Number two, Sean. Number two, I have Kansas State. And I want to be clear, like there are a lot of legitimate questions about this team, right? I I think that losing the guys that they did on the offensive line, losing Ben Sinnott, one of my favorite players at tight end in in the entire country last year, uh, that's a big deal. But I think that there's two things you have to look at. One is just the floor that I think has been set under this program with Chris Kleiman. Uh, Like, I I just think that we can expect them to be borderline contention almost every single year. And the other piece is I think that when you talk about dynamic play, like they have a chance to have one of the most dynamic offenses in the big 12. Uh, Avery Johnson, of course, gives you a lot of, different ways that he can do things right because we know what he is as a runner I think as a passer certainly he's got to come along I think he completed 54 percent of his passes last year but like he's also going to get more chance to do that right he's going to get more chance to to grow as a passer and the other piece that you have to love is oh my gosh like their running game has a chance to be pretty special right like their running game Obviously, Avery Johnson at quarterback, but but uh, DJ Giddens and now with Dylan Edwards coming in too, like they're going to be able to do some really sick stuff with that trio potentially. So it, I, I think that, again, this is a floor conversation. I think that potentially Kansas and Iowa State and maybe even Oklahoma State might have higher ceilings, maybe Arizona as well. But I think that when you talk about like reliability, Kansas State is just that program right now. Yeah, I, I actually have, have K-State at one. Um, and again, it's that floor. It's, it's that consistency. Well, you're wrong about that, but go on. No, 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 it's fine. That's fine. Um, like, for me, though, it becomes like, if I, if I want to pick a team that I am convinced is going to be in Arlington unless the catastrophic happens, um, it, it would be Kansas State. Because, again, they have built 
you know, they built under, under Bill Snyder, that consistency of offense and defensive line it's continued under Chris Kleiman. And that's been the basis of their team. And we have seen time and time again, that is the basis of good teams is you have a very strong offensive line, a very strong defensive line. And then the rest of that can take your team from great to, you know, excellent. And, and I think that's kind of where we're at is like, if there's a team that I am hundred percent sure is going to be a great team this year, it's going to be a Kansas state that has all of the building blocks that you need to have a great team. Um, can they be that excellent team that wins the big 12 and can potentially, you know, represent and, and, and win something in, in the college football playoff and, you know, advance around or something that's going to depend on how well Avery Johnson, you know, adapts to being the guy. I think he has the talent for it. The one question that I do have is it's going to be a lot different being the guy from the start of the year than it is, you know, kind of being the guy as the backup quarterback that everybody loves. It's kind of the change of pace that, um, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, he was, um, you know, he, he wasn't able to beat out, um, you know, guys last year. And, and it kind of took a little bit for him to actually get on the field. And, and, and I definitely understand that they all had the intention of kind of moving to him, but he, he did not, he did not necessarily impress in the way that you're just like automatically, Hey, he's going to be, you know, the guy moving forward. And, you look at the rest of the quarterbacks here in the conference, like, I mean, uh, I, it, there's an argument about whether Avery Johnson's in the top five of, of you know, quarterbacks in the conference, of, of, of quarterbacks at their best. And so I do think, though, that they have enough good talent across the board that that floor is going to be set. And, you know, I, 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 I just – I have a hard time picking them any lower. Like, I, I kept going. I was like, well – Am I, am I convinced that Kansas State or that, that Utah is going to be better than Kansas State? It was like, I could see it happening, but I'm not convinced that they're better. You know, same with Kansas. I could see it happening, but I'm not convinced that Kansas is better. Like all of those. So, like, look, it, it's just that's really what it comes down to me is that Kansas State is probably the most consistent team for me. The team that I am, if you, if you made me pick a team that was going to be in Arlington for sure, that's the one that I'd have to go with. Um, I have them third, which is basically like, Arlington alternate, which is also like, look, I, 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 I put OSU ceiling in it too. Like if K-State's there, let's, I'm not going to act surprised. Um, I do have questions. Uh, the offensive line stuff, Kansas State fans are pushed back every time. I'm like, like the whole selling point last year was they brought everybody back. Now you replace, well, but so-and-so has played and so-and-so has played. It's like, that's great. Backups take over as starters and they're not always as good as the guy who was the starter in front of them. I know Kansas State's going to have a good offensive line. It's a question. I, I get it with Avery Johnson. He's got to play a full season. We'll see how it goes. I, they've got the run, uh, arguably the best running back duo. It's them and UCF wanting to sit there and fight. And here comes West Virginia fans going, Shaheem White. And like I, the Kansas defense fans is, might argue with you too, but yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> the defense is going to be good. Like the defense is solid. I, I like they're right there. This is why I like tier conversations, but we have to do a ranking because this is a ranking week. Like, I had them at three. If you're mad because I don't have one, two, that's fine. It's not going to surprise me when, if when they're back in Arlington in December. Uh, okay, so Shahan, that leaves number one. Yeah. So, so here's the thing, right? Uh, Utah had a literal pig farmer playing quarterback last year <laughs> and managed to win eight games anyway. And now they're replacing a pig farmer with one of the best quarterbacks in the country maybe the best tight end in the country, three really, really, really good transfer receivers to go along with Money Parks, who was pretty good playing with a pig farmer last year. And also, by the way, they're Utah defensively. Like, to, it, there are some questions on the offensive line, I want to be clear. But, like, to me, Utah is clearly the team that has the most most pathways to being elite. They can be elite in the running game with uh, with Micah Bernard coming back after missing a lot of last season with an injury. They can be elite in the passing game with Cameron Rising back. They, I mean, the the two seasons that that Cameron Rising has played as a starting quarterback, both times they won the Pac-12. And then defensively, right, they have the ability to win games that way. And they did for so much of last season in just finding a way to win ga eight games anyway. So this is, to me, like, in the Big 12 especially, I think that – it's going to be about development cycles, right? Like, like that's just, I think, when you talk about teams that are on the up versus on the down versus kind of starting over, right? Kansas State is on the more starting over side of things after what they lost. 
Um, not that they don't have good players, but just they're earlier on the growth curve. And Utah's at the top of their growth curve. This potentially could be the best team that Kyle Whittingham has had since he's been a power conference coach, uh, first in the Pac-12, now in the Big 12, if things break right. And I will say, too, I mentioned about Jalen Daniels, right, and and some of the injury stuff keeping me down a little bit. And Cameron Rising hasn't played in a while, and that's certainly a, a big factor, although he has looked good in the limited action that we've seen. But the thing that I like, too, a very underrated move that they ended up making was bringing in Sam Heward as a transfer at quarterback, somebody who started all of last season for Cal Poly. Uh, he, coached, uh, he played, rather... Um, uh, two years ago at Washington, a former five-star prospect as well. And I think that that just gives them a legitimate uh, kind of higher floor at the backup quarterback position than what they had over the last year or two. So look, I, I mean, I think that certainly to to be number one legitimately, Cam Rising needs to be healthy for, let's say, nine games. But I think that for those games that he's not healthy, I like Utah's backup plan just a little bit more. So ultimately, I, I, I just think that this is clearly the most complete team in the conference heading in. That's at the top of their development cycle. And uh, and again, like to me, they are my pick to win the Big 12 and make the college football playoff. Yeah, the only thing that really worries me about that, right, is, I mean, we said it wasn't, you know, there was, there was talk about it not being a big deal for, a, a, you know, a, a school like UCF jumping to, you know, the big 12 or, or jumping to a different the conference Pac-12 was and, better than the big 12. But, last year. They just, they're coming from a better league. Well, no, no, no. The Pac-12 was better last year and that's it. I agree. Like you I go, agree. you go back 10 years, like, like the last no. 10 years uh, of the last 10 but years like to compare to UCF moving over. It is not remotely close to the same thing, right? Like it, it's not. No, no. And that's, and that's fine. But like, I, I was just I, honestly, I was kind of just using that as an example, but like even like like a Cincinnati, right, that had been going or com- competing very well, and and I do agree, it's going to be like not as as drastic of a step, but there is still quite a step of coming from you know the the friendly confines of the Pac-12 for them, uh, coming to a, a a conference like the Big 12 where you're much more spread out, you're having to travel a whole lot more. Um, I mean, travel is a lot more of an issue for the big 12 than it was for any of the pac 12. I mean, you, you, you look at the farthest that you had to travel as a pac 12 team. It was nowhere near, <laughs> nowhere near as bad. Um, and, and so like, I, again, that's not going to be like the thing that determines, but I do think that there's enough questions about whether cam rising comes back and is ready to go and, and is able to kind of perform at that peak level. Um, and, and I mean, like, I agree. They have solid guys all around. The real question for me is I look at that and I just, I don't know. And, and maybe it's just that they, that they have so many guys that are solid. I don't know what the thing that they hang their hat on is that is for sure always going to be better than every team that they're playing. It's you know? defense. They, they are really, really good defensively, especially up front. Like they, they, again, like I mentioned, they really had nothing. They were in some ways Pac-12 Iowa last year because of the injuries that they had on offense and they were able to win eight, eight games. So they're a team that every single week shows up defensively. They're really, really good up front. They've recruited that part of the ball extremely well. And they're also great on the back end as well. That's, that's a place where they've continuously had depth. So th- that's one of the reasons why they've been such a consistent, like nine win team is because their defense sets a floor underneath them to be clear uh, i have i have utah at three so i have utah at one i like this comment from nancy rex because it reminds me of dillingham's comment of they've been trying to get their team ready to have to go on the road you know by pumping in stadium noise because they're not used to that in the pac-12 of going places with full stadiums and loud fan bases <clears throat> i have utah one i am uh, i am less like Everything they have is amazing except the offensive line is Shahan is. I'll say this. I listened to uh, Andy is gone. Uh, I I listened to Splits on Duo this week and Richard Johnson's intro on it made me very happy because I finally heard someone actually say what I had felt for a while, which is yes, Utah is a a level of physicality that was very unique in the Pac-12. Right, you saw more teams like Oregon State start shift to that. There's the misconception, and I know Shahan is not 
a problem with this is you cover the Big 12. There's this misconception that the Big 12 is still this air raid conference because people can conflate air raid with spread as the same thing. And owner said spread is just a positioning air raid as a scheme where I am not like this idea that Utah is going to come into the conference <clears throat> and their physicality is just going to blow everyone away and no one's going to be prepared for it because the Big 12 doesn't know what physicality is. Kansas State is way more like Utah than I think nationally people realize. Iowa State is more like Utah in a lot of ways than people actually realize. I understand Utah recruits really, really well. They do. Um, and they that, that that system works. I, I, I think you are dead on. I preach this on the show all the time. The Big 12 is a conference of development cycles. And once you're to the top of it, that's you're going to have your good season and be under okay with the fact that when you come down, depending upon what your program level is at, is how low that bottom is going to be, but you're going to rise back up. And I do think Utah is the top of it. We do have to wonder about Cam rising. Um, Brent Keithy, the tight end, like very excited for him. Does he stay healthy? He hasn't played for a whole year. Like I have Utah one because I, I get all of that. Um, I just don't think that they are head and shoulders above everyone else. I think they are coming in. If all things are true and Cam rising has played, why why don't we give well, why don't we put as much scrutiny on him as Daniels because Daniels has had way more injury issues and the back is a bigger issue than what seventh year player Cam Rising is yeah. had to deal with. Like you, you know how to come back from an ACL in a, yes. in a way that you don't know with a back. Like it's it's so, a different injury. The the thing that I'll say though, I will flip one of your statements around on you, which is I think that people outside of the conference think well the Big Twelve knows. Uh, or knows how to deal with physicality because, you know, you have a team like Kansas State, right, in it. I think that that's also true that Kansas State is able to have a lot of success because of they do a lot of things that Utah does, right? Like one of the reasons that Kansas State has built this high floor for themselves is because they actually have a lot uh, DNA-wise similar to Utah. And I'm actually very sad that we don't get the Utah versus Kansas State game in the regular season this year. I think there's- That was on purpose. Yeah, it no, it, it would have created a crater in the world, unfortunately. So we couldn't do that. <laughs> but, um, but like, I do think that like a lot of the things that you like, like I think back to the last two years of Kansas State, right? Like, I, I think that, and this might be a way to think about Utah for uh, for Big Twelve fans is like for Kansas State, you know the things that will be there, right? Like, you know, physically on defense are going to be there. You know that they're going to try to to grind uh, to grind you out. And what gives you more of a ceiling is when you have your offensive skill players in place. And two years ago, right, you have that with Ben Sinnott and Deuce Vaughn. And in 23, you don't really have that to the same extent. And in 24, they're kind of in between, I think. You know, they, they've got it, uh, especially at running back, but, you know, receivers a little bit more of a question mark. Well, that's, I think, when you similar to Utah, right? Where Utah now, you're like, they added four receivers to join Money Parks, who's a good player. So they might be good at receiver. And you have a quarterback who might be good throwing the ball downfield. And you have a running back who's healthy now in Micah Bernard. Last year, they were playing a converted DB uh, in Sione Vaki because they had so many uh, injuries at the running back position. So that's that's for me like kind of like I, I think that these programs are so similar in the most complementary of ways and so i just see more guys with more experience to lean on when it comes to utah that i think gives them just uh, a, a lot more to work with than than kansas state does right now it'll be a hell of a way for whittingham to ride off into the sunset uh, in i mean final... actually like because i want to be clear too this is not me saying Utah is just going to own the conference, right? Like th right. this is saying the 2024 team, I think has a chance to be one of the best that he's put together. And guess what? You talk development cycles again, even if Whittingham comes back, might be an eight win team or a seven win team in 2025. All right. This is a good stopping point. Cause it's the longest episode I think we've ever had, um, which Shahan, I'm, I'm so sorry, but also like, thanks man. I appreciate you sticking around for two hours. Uh, you do an incredible job covering the big 12. Well, I want to get you out of here so you can go to bed since you actually have a child who is sleeping. I know what that is like. So plug where everyone can check out your work covering college football as a whole and the Big 12 especially. Yeah, you can find my work at cbsports.com. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at Shahan J. Uh, you can read all my... Did I already say cbsports.com? It is so late. I am. I am. Uh, I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> you can listen to my podcast also, the College Football Survivor Show. So I'll wake up in the morning tomorrow and, and record 
another uh, hopefully not two hours worth of content uh, to, to make sure and come to you guys on Friday. <laughs> uh, Steve Moser, Fancy Rex, was it Kip Bennett, uh, Brian Metcalf, everybody who's been watching, commenting, appreciate you guys. Thank you, everybody. Andy Mitz, of course, you can follow him at Andy Mitz 12 and check out the Rock Chalk podcast for our Kansas coverage in the 1012 network. Uh, we are now, as a 1012 podcast, going to take a few weeks off. Uh, we just put out five episodes of content, so there's plenty of you for go to go and listen to and get yourself ready for the season. Again, thank you to Shahan. Thank you to Andy. Thank you to everybody who joined us for this entire week. This is a two-hour episode, so um, goodbye. Podcast Network.